I think I have power. Excellent connection. In the green on my stream keys. Hello. Hi, Josephine. Hopefully the stream is much better now. Um, I worked on my computer a bit. I had my husband work on my computer a bit and um, it finally occurred to me to just email some other people and see if they were also having trouble streaming kind of in the morning hours. And they were like, yeah, it's real choppy. So um, I think that some of our neighborhoods are just really, really in crunch time with uh, the amount of bandwidth coming through and how much is needed. And so we need to come up with a time for our class to meet that is not at 10 o'clock because I think that's the problem. Um, the rest of my streaming has been perfectly fine. It's only been an issue for you guys at 10 a.m. So um, if three o'clock works well for people, I'm okay with that. If this needs to be negotiable so most people can come, I'm fine with that. Just uh, let me know. Either email me or, you know, text it to me or whatever you got to do to let me know what's going on. Okay. I'm sorry for all of the technological issues. I had a lot of those kind of in mind and in place when I was, you know, going to put this online. And then it didn't even occur to me to think about how much strain and pressure the system was going to be under. So things I did not factor for, but it sounds like other people didn't either, so I don't feel too bad. Okay, <clears throat> so starting all over from scratch <laughs> with what I was going to talk about today. Um, okay, awesome. I think it'll probably work for a lot of people if I had to guess. I don't think there's too many classes that are Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 2.30, but some of them might be. And if there are, let me know and we can come up with another time. I mean, like, I don't care if it's 10 at night. You know, I want as many people to have access as possible. So, okay. Well, here we go. Day two of glycolysis. So hopefully you got to watch the video that I posted the other day about um, glycolysis on the... Wednesday, I guess it was Wednesday. Um, so just to kind of recap a few things. There's a whole process of getting glucose into your cells that I think is useful to talk about, even if, um, you know, it's not really covered as part of, of the biochemistry because it's kind of not, it's more like just cellular transport. But I think that it's, useful just kind of understanding it from a global perspective. And so you eat glucose. I mean, I suppose you could also inject it if you're like, you know, hooked up to an IV bag or something. But for the vast majority of us, we'd be eating glucose. Once it, it doesn't really absorb into your stomach, but it tends to absorb in your intestine. And so once it's in your intestine, it's into the bloodstream. and then tells the pancreas to release insulin. So insulin is the hormone that your body releases when you have had sugar. Um, and so that one is probably the most known of the, the hormones, maybe even more so than things like estrogen and testosterone. Um, and that's simply because there are so many people with diabetes who have insulin problems that, you know, you guys, or even dogs, right? Like my dog's got diabetes, so he's insulin dependent. Um, so the insulin tells cells that they can take in glucose. Um, without the insulin, your body doesn't know that. So that's why... Um, 
there's way too much sugar in the blood of untreated diabetics, you know, because it, it can't get into the cells because there's no insulin there to say it needs to get into the cells. <clears throat> then in the cells, in the cytosol, and I'll ask, uh, it might be useful if you know the difference between cytosol and cytoplasm. So cytosol is the like liquidy matrix and the cytoplasm is all the stuff inside the cell. Oh, you smell gooey. <laughs> I like to think of cells as having like a gooey liquid inside. Um, they probably don't, but I don't know. I just, I like to think of it that way. And so that's where glycolysis kind of starts and picks up is after glucose is in the cell. So step one, which we talked about the other day, hexokinase adds a phosphate to glucose. Hi, Drew. So hexokinase adds a phosphate to glucose using ATP to make glucose 6-phosphate, which I'll just abbreviate that way. And so that was kind of where we left off. We talked about how this is an important step. This is regulated, which makes sense. And I talked about that on Wednesday. And it also traps the glucose into the cell. It's an irreversible reaction. So once you slap the phosphate on there, you don't unslap the phosphate on there. And so that's where we kind of left off with at the end of step one. So step two is what I will be focusing on today. And I want to make sure I follow the notes that I actually have here for you guys. There we go. <clears throat> so glucose 6-phosphate is converted to fructose 6-phosphate. Can't even type today. So the enzyme that does this is called phosphoglucoisomerase. Um, you'll see over and over again that we have different um, kind of classes of enzymes. So kinases are a class of enzymes that add phosphate using ATP. Isomerases are ones that do the same sort of chemistry over and over and over again. Well, you guys are cute. Look at you networking and working through YouTube. <laughs> I don't think YouTube was meant to do uh, chemistry labs, but here we are. <laughs> um, Okay, so I want to talk about the terminology here. Oh, shoot, what did I just do? I'm going to kind of like indent this. So you'll notice that phosphoglucoisomerase has um, kind of the name of the starting material. So glucose 6-phosphate is a phosphoglucose. And then um, as far as the isomerase goes, it's an enzyme that swaps an alcohol and an albide. And so that's what you'll see kind of all the time. It is forming an isomer, right? So I want you to think about um, kind of what that would look like. Where's, oh, I think my pad. Okay, there we go. So like, let's imagine you have something like this. What a, 
what an enzyme that's an isomerase will do is swap the OH and the carbonyl. Okay, so that is essentially what this enzyme is going to do, and it's not the only isomerase we're going to see, just like the hexokinase wasn't the only kinase that we're ever going to see. But I wanted to kind of get started with that. All right. Now, if you think about the difference in energy between these two molecules, they're almost exactly the same, right? Like the structures are almost identical. And in fact, in these, they are identical if you rotate it at 180 degrees. But generally speaking, these are going from one group of functional groups to the same group of functional groups. And so it would make sense that for the thermodynamics on this, the value is very close to zero. The, the, um, the free energy value. And so what this means is that when we're talking about the, again, the standard state free energy, which is kind of what I'm talking about here, your number is going to be able to fluctuate on either side of that zero into the positive side or the negative side based off the concentration of substrates that are going through the system. So that means that this is reversible. And because it's reversible, it doesn't need to be regulated. Okay. So that um, is kind of the very beginning of this um, information. And then I need to talk about, let's see. The evolutionary benefit of this particular reaction. And I think that that could be, like if you just had to guess based off looking at it, you'd have a hard time coming up with something. This is one of those where you have to look at it in the context of the rest of glycolysis and kind of the rest of cellular respiration to kind of understand why your body would have, or why basically all organisms um, would have developed the need to do this particular reaction. Like why would you need to swap an alcohol and um, a carbonyl? So in a few steps, we will make our first carbon-carbon cut, meaning we're going to break our first carbon-carbon bond out of the five that exist in, um, in glucose. So <clears throat> when we do this, it will make, um, how do I want to say that, symmetric molecules. Whereas if we didn't do this step, we would have a two and four carbon sugar going through the process. So we basically end up, when, when we move these functional groups the way that we have, or that we will in this, when we break the molecules, we will break them in half to give two, three carbon sugars or two, three carbon molecules. If we didn't move the aldehyde or the um, carbonyl, <clears throat> you would end up with a two and a four carbon unit instead. And so if you have two, three carbon units, you could basically use one set of enzymes to carry those through the rest of the glycolytic pathway. Whereas if you had a two and a four, you'd have to have two sets of enzymes for everything there on out. And that could be very difficult to evolve, right? Like this is the way that evolved because it was the easiest way to get to point A to point B, okay? And so as far as the mechanism goes, and this one is beastly compared to the last one. And so there are a couple of things I want to point out as far as the mechanism goes. Number one is that we have to essentially take the glucose and make it linear. We have to linearize it to get the carbonyl, right? If I have cyclic glucose, 
in the, you know, cyclic form where it looks like either a furan or a pyran, there's no carbonyl available. It's a hemiacetal. So I have to first make it a linear glucose, which is why one of the first things I had you guys do was kind of look at breaking open a glucose and, and sticking it back together. And so that's the step one. The second step is to do the isomerization. And to do this, it forms what's called a cis-in-thiol intermediate. And I'll get to that in just a second. Um, and then we recyclize to form fructose 6-phosphate. Let me make sure I, did I write that up here? Oh, I wrote to make glucose 6 phos. oh wait, no. There, okay, I had it. I just wanted to make sure I wrote the right thing down. Okay, so as far as a cis-enediol, that's like straight up organic words, okay? So if you have cis, that means something on the same side of either a ring or a double bond. And in this case, it's a double bond. So cis-ene, ene meaning the alkene, diol meaning two hydroxyls, okay? So what I just drew is the world's most simple cis-ene diol right? But that's going to be the intermediate in this particular mechanism. So um, just kind of keep that one in mind because that if you are trying to get from point A to point C, right? Sometimes it can be hard if you don't remember what B is. And so I think it's useful to remember like little words that help trigger me into remembering what can happen next. So I know when I'm doing this particular reaction, if I have not formed a cysteine diol, I didn't do it right, okay? And so that's, that's kind of where I wanted to leave that, okay? All right, so, I'm going to actually do this in the more conventional way that I prefer to draw these, which is to actually use a circle to indicate the enzyme pocket, because I think that that makes it easier. And I wasn't really sure the best way to go about doing that the other day, and I forgot, I was like, oh wait, I can just add the shape of a circle, that'll be easier. Because if I try and make a circle, oh, of course I can do a good one now. I've been struggling in the circle department on my writing pad, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, so when we're looking inside of this binding pocket, the thing that's going to bind to it is just regular old glue. Short it out on me for a second. Okay. And up here, I have my CH2 with my phosphate on it. My AOH coming down, up, down. And I'm going to put a bond there. You know, I'm going to make that a little easier to see. And then my little wonky bond here. Okay, so that is my glucose 6-phosphate. And essentially what I need to show is a bunch of um, functional groups, or functional groups isn't the right word, bases and acids inside this pocket that can do the chemistry. So I'm going to put a miscellaneous base 
which would be an amino acid that would be like the conjugate base of aspartic acid, so aspartate or lysine or something like that, right? So the conjugate base of any of the ones that had some sort of pKa value, the basic form. And I'm going to have my H plus up here, which is just any kind of miscellaneous proton that would be available. And so to open up the ring, my base has to take off a proton. And then these electrons will come up and grab the hydrogen. What am I doing? That is not right at all. I'm sorry. These electrons will come in here to form a carbon-oxygen double bond. And then these electrons will grab the hydrogen. Here we go. Something, 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 the best laid plans of mice and men. Something, something. Okay, so with that first step, we have now successfully opened up our glucose, all right? So I think that the best way to show this is to kind of keep the integrity of the cyclic form. It makes it easier, in my opinion, to see what's going on. But I guess you could kind of do it however you want. So for me, I have an alcohol there now. And I'm still just going to show this. As kind of just I'm like basically opening it up there, right? Up, down. Up. Okay. So at this point, I still have glucose six phosphate. Now I don't have glucose six phospho pyranose, I have glucose 6-phosphate in the linear form, which would just be glucose 6-phosphate. Um, but the next thing I have to do is to form the cis-ene diol, which I mentioned. Okay, So that is going to be hard to do unless I add a couple of little things. One is a hydrogen there, and I need another proton source. Okay. Now, what's going to be weird about this, and I'll need a base as well, is that our step is going to include taking a hydrogen right off of a carbon. And in my experience, this is where my students tend to have a lot of problems. Because at this point in your organic chemistry knowledge, 100% of the time, you have deprotonated a hydroxyl group, not the carbon the hydroxyl group is attached to, right? But that's not how biochemistry works. Biochemistry evolves to do the reaction that you need to do um, in a way that is going to progress um, down the chain. And so it's actually quite an elegant reaction. I think this is really neat. The base takes off the proton from the carbon. And then these electrons will form the alkene and these can come up and grab the hydrogen. And so with those three arrows, we have made the cis-ene diol. Okay. The cis-ene diol product, or rather, um, I guess you could kind of consider this an intermediate, even though it's still part of the same reaction. Up, down, up. Okay. So this is my cysteine dial. Keep that in mind. I oftentimes like to abbreviate or to uh, label that. That is not required. But remember, for me, I always like to do stuff consistently so I get it right every time. <laughs> and that really helps. And part of me knowing this reaction mechanism 
is knowing there's a cysteine diol intermediate and that there's a cysteine diol intermediate every single time we see an isomerase reaction, okay? So kinases, I know I need an ATP. Isomerases, I know I need a cysteine diol. And those types of little pieces of information help me because I'm really bad at memorizing stuff. Like, it's very hard for me to just memorize rote facts over and over and over again. So for me, if I can just have, whoops, about that. If I can just have little reminders of where I need to go from here kind of thing, that's really, really helpful for me. So I said after we form the cysteine diol, we basically have to um, form the fructose and kind of recyclize it. And so that's actually going to happen in two steps. I kind of acted like it was one on your um, on your overview, but okay. So if I had my my carbonyl here and my alcohol here, and I'm needing to swap those two positions, right? Because that's what's happening here. I basically need to make a carbonyl right there. And if you notice, I already have an alcohol right here. So that's already done. So the first part is basically converting one part to the alcohol and the next part is converting the other alcohol to the carbonyl. And so that's a very easy reaction because we have these, um, this like conjugated system. I guess you wouldn't really call it a conjugated system, but we have this double bond that's basically going to facilitate that. So I can deprotonate for my carbon oxygen double bond, and then these can come out and grab a proton. And when you do that, now you no longer have glucose 6-phosphate, you have fructose 6-phosphate, which is exactly what we needed, okay? I still have it in the linear form and not the cyclic form, even though I'm kind of drawing it like it's a cyclic. Up, down, up. Okay. And so the next part, give me just a second. I'm going to have to, I have to do a thing. So the next step is to actually just cyclize this. And so that's basically the backwards of what we started with up here. So base deprotonates, collapses in and grabs it, right? So we basically have to do the opposite of that by deprotonating this OH right here. And I just realized I did that all in blue instead of white. So I'll do my other stuff in white to make it stand out. Protonate, attack, protonate. And then now you have fructose 6 phosphate. And fructose forms, if you follow this type of chemistry, Fructose will be present in the um, furanose form. So this is fruct phos fructose, let's see, fructofuranose 6-phosphate or 6-phosphofructofuranose. There's kind of different ways you could name that. So the stereochemistry on this one, right, because we're still kind of looking at these like they're a Hayworth projection, even though I haven't been bolding all these lines, but um, that's how biochemists view these. So this one pointing up, this one points down, 
this one points up, then there's an OH that points down here. And so here's that sixth carbon, right? We haven't lost a carbon in this. Now it's just a CH2OH. So if you looked at fructose in a Fisher projection, Carbon 1 has an OH, carbon 2 is the carbonyl. 3, 4, 5. There we go. Um, Forgive me, I need to look up that stereochemistry again for the Fisher projection on this. Okay. But so we don't draw it as the cyclic form because, or the uh, linear form because in your body it's going to be in a cyclic form. All right. So I'll let you finish writing that and then I want you to ask me if you have any questions. And then we're going to go to the next step. Thanks, Drew. I appreciate the feedback. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and go on to the third step then, and this will be the last one for today. I try not to do more than two a day because I like to kind of have those have time to sink in and settle in before we do a bunch, right? So I like to think that the difference between this class, whether we're online or in person, and say something like cell biology is that we really take time to appreciate the actual chemical reactions that are happening in biochemistry. And so um, I feel like if we just learned all, if I gave you all 10 mechanisms and reactions and just told you to learn them on your own, it would be less beneficial to you. Like you wouldn't have a lot of time to kind of consider it and think about it in comparison to when we take our time and go through it. So, um, okay. So that said, fructose 6 phosphate is going to be converted to fructose. One comma six bisphosphate using phosphofructokinase and ATP. Okay, couple things. And if any of you are in inorganic chemistry, you're going to look at this and say, that's odd to use bisphosphate in this context instead of diphosphate. I agree. And I was not consulted many years ago when this reaction was was named and, you know, recognized. So <clears throat> to this point, when you're doing organic chemistry, you talk about something having like 1,6 diols, triols, tetrols. Bisphosphate is more used in inorganic chemistry to talk about um, like chelation chemistry and ligands that are attaching to metals 
which I suppose a phosphate could if you have two of them, but it's a weird way to use that um, prefix. So we use it because that's what is commonly used in biochemistry, but I will point out every single time I teach this that I think it's really weird and I don't like it. Okay. So fructose 6-phosphate is going to be converted to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate using fr phosphofructokinase and ATP, and I don't know why I capitalized that. So as far as the terminology goes, this one should be pretty obvious. Phosphofructose represents the starting material. And then a kinase is an enzyme that adds a phosphate using ATP. Right, that's the class of, of enzyme. You'll notice that this is the way things tend to be named in biochemistry. There's something that indicates usually either the starting material or the product in the name, and then there's some sort of enzyme designation, like the, the type of reaction that does kinase, isomerase, synthase, synthetase, phosphatase, phosphate, you know. So we'll get into more examples of some of those throughout this, but just realize that a kinase is a kinase is a kinase. And what's interesting about a kinase is they have the same exact mechanism every single time. And isomerase has the same exact mechanism every single time. They are reproducible, right? So I talked early on, and if you've had any genetics, this probably um, strikes as something you've heard before, if you've ever had the evolution class, where <clears throat> we have evolutionarily conserved enzymes, right? So it's like one enzyme developed to do something and throughout millennia of evolution, those got copied through genetic defects, right? Um, when you get these like copy paste errors during DNA replication and stuff like that, during um, a germ cell formation, all of that stuff. And so we end up with a lot of these enzymes that are very, very similar that do the same exact thing in the same exact way. So just kind of realize that when we see one of these over and over and over again, that's just how your bodies work. Okay. The evolutionary benefit on this one is probably going to make more sense than the last one because it's easy to see right now. It creates symmetry in the molecule by adding a phosphate to both sides. So at this point, there's a phosphate on carbon six. And if we put a phosphate on carbon one, now we have a diphosphorylated sugar. So now we're having this kind of symmetry built up, which is important for the reasons I stated in step two. When we cleave it in half, you want two of the same things that can go through the rest of the reactions all the same way. So you don't have to evolve two different sets of enzymes to do the same chemistry, okay? And so, Thinking about the thermodynamic aspect of this, it's going to be very much in line with what we saw in hexokinase, the first step of glycolysis. So number one, it uses ATP. So as far as using ATP goes, you release a lot of free energy from that. This has a very negative delta G. Um, And so this is an irreversible reaction, all right? And so that gets into the regulation aspect. So a couple things about this particular reaction. Number one, it is irreversible. So I can't go backwards once I've gone forwards, right? This is the first committed step of glycolysis. And what I mean by that is when I have glucose being converted to glucose 6-phosphate, and that glucose 6-phosphate can be converted to fructose 6-phosphate reversibly, right? That one was a reversible reaction. There are a couple different things that can happen from that point, okay? So I think it would actually be easier if I drew these, even though going to take up a little bit of room. So 
let's say I have glucose. I make glucose 6 phosphate. And then I have this reversible reaction that makes fructose 6 phosphate and an irreversible reaction that makes fructose 1 6 bisphosphate. Okay. At this stage here, glucose 6 phosphate can be used to make glycogen. So the glycogen pathway is where your body makes sugar for storage. Um, and then also at that point, you can go through and make ribose sugars through a pathway called the pentose phosphate pathway or the pentose monophosphate shunt. A uh, couple different names for that pathway. So at this point, uh, when we have this here, there's not a whole lot else that can happen other than glycolysis, okay? So this is a major branch point. And I mentioned that with branch points, Sorry, Josephine, I just saw what you said. Um, okay, try and draw it out. Got it. <laughs> um, so with glycolysis, you know, once you've gotten to that fructose 1,6 bisphosphate step, I can see it okay, Miranda, on my end, but that doesn't mean you guys can see it all. Okay, let me know if... Mine looks okay. It might be an internet issue, which we're finding a lot of right now, aren't we? Okay, so it's the first committed step of glycolysis. Um, because it's the first step that basically says, at this point, I have no other choices but glycolysis, right? Before it was, well, I could make glycogen out of this. I could make ribose for, for RNA and DNA. And so that just kind of, whoa, that went faster than I expected. Okay, so that is our first committed step. So we would actually expect this to be regulated. And so it is. There are, this is the most regulated step of glycolysis. Okay. Well, I'm sorry, sweetie. Um, and I know you live out in the boonies too, so <laughs> that's probably not helping the situation any. All right. The most regulated step of glycolysis. Is that where I let off with? Okay, so I actually have these written down because I can't remember them all. Um, and you don't need to memorize these or anything. I mean, I'm not even going to see you in person the rest of the semester, so <laughs> memorizing them wouldn't really be all that useful even for the type of exams that we're going to have. But um, there are lots and lots of regulators for this particular reaction, and so I want you to just kind of get an appreciation for how many there are by giving you some of these. So first thing is that phosphofructokinase, and this is actually called phosphofructokinase 1. There's also a phosphofructokinase 2, which makes uh, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. But this is the most regulated step. So phosphofructokinase 1 is five times larger than other kinases to allow for extra allosteric regulation sites. <laughs> okay. And so this is where I, I write them all down. So this would be considered feedback inhibition, where something further down the line inhibits everything. So there's feedback inhibition by ATP citrate, which comes from the citric acid cycle or the TCA cycle, and then phosphoenol pyruvate, which is step nine of glycolysis. Okay, so that is the feedback inhibition. 
There's also feed forward activation by a lot of stuff too. So ADP. So if your body's like, hey, I don't have any ATP, I've got a lot of ADP. Well, yeah, you might want to push everything through glycolysis so you can make some more ATP, right? So that kind of makes sense. ADP, um, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. One, one so the actual product of this tells it to make more of the product, which I think that one's a little bit strange. Fructose 6-phosphate does it. Um, AMP does it. You might not know what AMP is. So if ATP is adenosine triphosphate and ADP is adenosine diphosphate, AMP is adenosine monophosphate. And so that one is actually made. Um, AMP is made by two ADPs to make an ATP plus an AMP. So this is kind of a scavenging mechanism that your body uses once your ADP levels get really, really high and your ATP levels get really, really low. So this is another indicator that you don't have any energy and you need to make more of it. So that's another one that would be useful to understand. So basically every time your body needs ATP, your AMP levels increase, your ADP levels increase, these are all going to tell this enzyme that it needs to go through the pathway and the process. Okay. Um, okay. And then last, <laughs> I can spell mechanism, right? Um, same as hexokinase and all other kinases. Okay. Give me a sec. Get my circle. I'm going to make this one kind of big so I can fit everything in there. Okay. So. I'm going to put my ATP in here. And again, I'm going to draw it as ADP with a phosphate attached to it because that way we can draw out a mechanism that actually makes sense and see the chemistry. This is very typical for biochemistry to do this um, with not just ATP, but with other things as well, like um, coenzyme A has a thiol on it. So we tend to draw that as coash with an SH so you can show the thiol reacting. phosphate up down up down up this is carbon number one this is carbon number six so to add a phosphate onto carbon one which is right there I like that one better so that's where we're sticking a phosphate. So hopefully when you look at that, you think, yeah, if I stick a phosphate there, that's definitely going to make the molecule look more symmetric, right? Okay. So nucleophile attacks the electrophile, which should be unsurprising to you at this point in your lives. Okay. So my base is going to come and take that off. And in one fell swoop, I'm going to grab my phosphate, kick off the phosphate. Okay. or kick off the rest of the ADP, which is essentially a leaving group in this case, right? And it's like you don't really think about nucleophilic substitution reactions and happening in um, biochemistry, right? We don't call them that, but, you know, we're substituting um, a hydrogen for a phosphate in this case. So the chemistry is very similar to what you've seen before. 
You'll also notice that in biochemistry, we show pretty much everything like it is a concerted reaction mechanism, whether it is um, concerted or stepwise, it's always just shown this way. And we also take all of these shortcuts in how we draw things. So instead of putting the bond here as a negative charge on the oxygen and then attacking, you just kind of go through and show it this way um, because it takes up less room. And some of our mechanisms are quite extensive, um, bigger than the last ones that we have done. And we will see that here shortly. And then we get our product. So, uh huh. That's not what I was wanting, but now I have a really nice round oxygen. Got a phosphate there. Up, down, up, down. There we go. And then you would have ADP left over. You can show that with a bond to an oxygen with if you want, or you could just call it ADP. Either way would be considered appropriate. Okay, so that is your lecture for today, ladies and gentlemen. If you have questions, please let me know. And then I need to post these for you, um, these notes. Also, yesterday, Brandon and I went into the lab <laughs> and I took pictures of the gel that we did. Um, one of you, one, one of the four groups had a really, really good looking gel. I'm not going to tell you who it was. I'll just let you all believe it was your beautiful gel that you made because <laughs> we can do that right now. Um, and to be honest, I don't remember who was one alpha, Uno, whatever we called all of those different names. Everybody was number one, right? Well, I sent one along with it, um, and I posted that on D2L, so you can look at that. We're not doing full formal lab reports for the rest of the semester for our lab class, and Conrad, if you're watching, you can just tune out right now because I know you're not in lab with us, but um, I also recorded a demonstration of the lab that we have missed so far, so the lab that we were supposed to do last week was doing kind of a demonstration of size exclusion chromatography. And so I had Brandon just record a 20 minute video um, for our class with me showing you guys how to do that. And so I'll post the link for that video onto D2L also. And I'll put another little assignment on there like to have me make sure you know what, you know, size exclusion chromatography is and that you've watched the video. That's basically, I, I can see if you've watched the video or not, it'll, it'll let me know in D2L who hasn't watched it and whatever, but I think that that's about what we can do for the semester as far as labs go. Um, one day of lab, the next day, which was supposed to be today because we missed last week, but one of the days in lab was going to be a lecture and it was going to be me talking to you about all the different techniques we can use to purify proteins. And then we were going to use those techniques to purify proteins, and that kind of hasn't happened. So I'll still make that video, that lecture, for you to watch. Um, I don't think I'll do it streaming. I'll just write it up and post it, and then you guys can watch it. And then I'll come up with some other videos, like maybe show you guys some links or something. I'm not sure yet for what we're going to do for the last few weeks of the semester. So... That's where I am now. I hope you guys are doing okay. In my organic class today, one of my students said that one of his coworkers had had access and um, contact with someone who had COVID-19. So she ended up having to get tested and went home and he's afraid he has it now, I guess. And so this is kind of getting really weird. If any of you find that you need anything, if you're like, hey, I need toilet paper or rice or beans or something, I guess. Uh, let me know. I have extra stuff I don't mind sharing. I've been a big time prepper for many years. Um, that makes me sound like one of the apocalyptic people. It's not. It's just, I think, 
an artifact. A lot of us Southern people had family that learned these things in the Depression, and we just kind of have kept carrying on where you grow more than you need in the summer and you freeze it and you can it just in case, right? Well, now we're at just in case time, I guess. So uh, I miss you. I miss your faces. I found a neat website thing. Let me find it. Give me a sec. It is called Ingo. Ingo. It's actually meant for people who are like in Asia studying English as a second language. And so it kind of does the same sort of thing Zoom does, but in a little bit of a more, it's simpler, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So, oh, good to know. Thank you, Miranda. Yeah. Um, but anyway, what's nice about this compared to like Skype or Zoom is that you don't have to have anything downloaded on your computers or anything. I basically just give you a link and we can sign in and talk through webcam directly using the internet without using any apps or anything. I have to start it and you can have six people at a time doing it. So it wouldn't be great for a, a regular class or anything, but if you need some like in-person office hours where you show me things or whatever, that's an option for us. So let me know and I will talk to you guys later, I guess. Um, I guess on Monday, I'll post the stuff that I have for lab, that video I was talking about, I'll post that and um, y'all take care and let me know if you need anything. Miss you. Join me for Fancy Hat Friday next week. Feel free to wear a fancy hat.